Hi, everybody in podcast land and also on YouTube. I'm James. I'm David. I'm Riley. <laughs> I missed out. I didn't know we were doing that. Okay. This is the Carpool Critic Movie Podcast, where today we are covering The Mitchells vs. the Machines, an Woo. animated movie from the creators of Enter the Spider-Verse. Spoiler alert! That's kind of like thematically uh, related to this movie because it's, it's so crazy. And this is a spoiler podcast. Yes. So, David, what are you giving this movie out of 10? It may take too long to lay the groundwork for its threadbare arcs, but The Mitchells versus The Machines provides very high-quality laughs, a striking and unique aesthetic, and the bare minimum everywhere else to make my machine heart grow half a size. Oh. 8 out of 10. Wow. I Wait, liked it. 8 out of 10 is like, eh, I'll throw it an 8. It, I'm a little bit conflicted. My score was lower, but then the more I thought about it and the more other movies I compared it to, I'm like, I did like that better than Onward. Yeah. I think I like it almost as much as Soul, and I want to, like, posthumously, that's not the right word, but you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> Lower my score of soul and onward just a little bit. Mm. Interesting. Retroactively. Yeah, retroactively. Oh, man. Riley, you're up. I almost went through the exact same thought process. Here's my slogan. The Mitchells versus the Machines may veer more towards quantity than quality at times, but it's a sensory feast and a thrilling journey, chock full of weird people, family values, and undiagnosed ADHD. 7.75 <laughs> out of 10. Yeah. I went to the 0.25 increments for this one because I, I, I had the same struggle. I was like, how do I feel about it? I don't know. Like, it was fun, but I wasn't crying at the end like I was for Onward a little bit. Yeah. Mm, they had the feels in that movie. This one is visually stunning and narratively fine. The <laughs> Mitchells vs. the Machines is a must-watch for families who can only watch family movies and, uh, <laughs> sure, no reason to avoid it for everyone else. Yeah, I, I think yeah. we're all completely aligned. Totally. Um, it is difficult to score it because it's one of the, it's kind of a bimodal score. Like yeah. you got the one hump where it's like, well, it was just okay. Like David said at the beginning, kind of took a while to get going. But then there's moments that are so oh, funny so yeah. and so awesome. So uh, like you guys, I'm giving it a seven out of ten. Yeah, no. we're all in this. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. not like us. That's a different score than either <laughs> well, of us gave it. <laughs> well, it's in the same ballpark, and I did I consider so. doing a seven point two five. Yeah. And here we are. Could have been as low as a 6.75. Oh my yeah. gosh. <laughs> Tragedy avoided. <laughs> I think it'll be really fun to discuss how this movie breaks down after we break down <laughs> our sponsor. Oh, are you riding a segue? <laughs> Just kidding. They're not a sponsor. This video is brought to you by Manscaped and their brand new fourth generation trimmer, the Lawnmower 4.0. It offers ceramic blades with skin safe technology, reducing nicks and cuts that can easily be replaced with a fresh blade. This time around, it has a wireless charging system that's compatible with most Qi charging pads, so no need to bring cables with you, and it lasts 90 minutes on a full charge, so you probably don't have to think about it at all, really. The Lawnmower 4.0 is waterproof, it's wireless, and it includes four different trimmer guards, so check it out at the link below and get 20% off, plus free international shipping when you use the promo code CARPOOL20. I okay, I will. I need to upgrade. <laughs> We're also brought to you by Private Internet Access VPN. PIA helps you hide your true IP address so that you can bypass your restrictions and censorship. You can connect up to 10 devices at once and it includes an internet kill switch. Dog, pig, dog, pig, loaf of bread. If your <laughs> VPN gets disconnected <laughs> involuntarily. PIA is available for Windows, Mac, Android, iOS, and even as a content Chrome extension, so check it out at your lmg.gg slash carpool critics location near you. <laughs> <laughs> This is why it's important for people to watch the movie before they listen to the episode because if you have, you have no idea what I'm talking about, dog pig. Dog when you're watching dog the movie, pig. do you think, oh, that's gonna be my, no, that's gonna be my, my no, well, uh, in know? the best of times, I prepare it ahead of time, and most of the time, I'm just like while you're while you're reading it, I'm like, uh, but you just continually pull out like some of the best moments, James. Thank you. Well, actually, not continually. Yeah, okay, uh, okay. couple There's stinkers hits and recently. Misses. Okay, we'll say that. It's like this movie. Just like this movie. Hey, want to remember what happened in it? What happened in this movie? Okay. Honestly, I kind of forgot. By the, like, <laughs> I watched it Saturday, and A I'm like, what happens. did happen in this movie? Oh man, here we go. When creative outsider Katie Mitchell is accepted into film school, she can't wait to leave home and find her people. But her nature-obsessed dad, Rick, insists on taking her, her mom, Linda, brother, Aaron, and dog, Munchy? Mon Monchy? I forget how they say it. Monchy. Monchy. Tom. On a totally not awkward or forced road trip to college. Meanwhile, tech executive Mark Bowman unveils a new line of robots to replace his popular AI assistant, Pal. In revenge, Pal commandeers the robots and begins capturing humans worldwide to launch them into space. After evading capture, Katie convinces Rick to help save the world. So with the help of two defective robots, Eric and Deborah Bot 5000, they head to a nearby mall to upload, upload Pal's kill code. A battle with AI appliances and a giant Furby ensues, destroying the mall's router, so the family heads to Silicon Valley to upload the kill code directly. But Pal captures Rick and Linda and reprograms Eric and Deborah Bot, forcing Katie and Aaron to hide. Watching recordings of her childhood on her camera, 
Katie realizes that Rick gave up on his dream of living in the woods to care for his daughter. Reinvigorated, she returns to Pal's lair, using Munchie's confusing appearance to cause the robots to malfunction. With Mark's help, Rick and Linda free themselves and plan to play Katie's video of Munchie to short-circuit all the robots, but, Ru but Rick is stopped by robots as he struggles to use a computer. Pal captures Aaron and Katie, who explains to Pal that relationships are hard and people are different, but families are still worth fighting for. Pal ignores her and drops Katie to fall to her death. Eric and Deborah Bot, inspired by Rick's reprogramming that allowed him to use a computer, upload Katie's video and save her mid-fall, allowing her to find and drop Pal into water, freeing all the humans and disabling all the robots, except for Eric and Deborah Bot. A few months later, Katie finally makes it to college and later joins her family on another road trip to DC to accept the Congressional Medal of Honor. Wow, that's about as good of an ending as you could hope for. <laughs> yeah, it's Star Wars ending, baby. National heroes, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> if Manchi gets a medal though, and unlike Chewbacca, Oh, <laughs> I'm just joking. I don't Wait, even know. He? Yeah, I no, don't it doesn't know. show him. <laughs> this is a joke. <laughs> That'd be pretty funny though, as a, as an homage. Yeah, her dad should have stayed in the woods. <laughs> uh, why not? You can raise kids in the woods. Yeah, that was a that was a plot point that I was a bit confused about. Where I'm like, wait, why couldn't he just like make her like a survivalist girl in the you know? She could have been a free kid. School. Yeah, you know we have those here in BC, free kids. What's I that? know somebody met a free kid. Like a kid who doesn't have like a birth certificate. The government doesn't know about the kid. Oh, the like just a totally off grid. Are person. they like feral? <laughs> no, they have like they're raised by a family. Of they, ha they live in a house. <laughs> they just are. Off. They just they just are not house, known about by the state. House read rock cave. <laughs> <laughs> I think though, that, that's kind of indicative of how this movie handles a lot of its ideas or its uh, emotionality is it paints really broad strokes. It's like, hey, he was a nature guy. We're not going to explain why they have to come to the city. Yeah. But like they had to. He had to sacrifice for her. And it's like, it's fine to me. It's just like, OK, yeah, that's not what the movie's focusing on. It's doing the absolute minimum to make that work. Well, it does do double duty because it's like he needed something to sacrifice. Mm -hmm. That becomes important later that he gave up on dreams for her. Um, but also it sets like thematically he is an acron an anachronism. Yeah, he mm. loves nature and oldie timey stuff. And yep. she is very of the moment and Mimi and Internet is my life and and she's Zoomer AF. Yeah, I like that about the movie that it's the movie. Like this movie could have easily landed in the like cell phones are bad camp and been like, oh yeah, we need to connect with our families. And it does a little bit of that, but I think it also goes on a little bit past that to be like hey, there is good things about the internet. Like, this connectivity we have through the internet isn't all bad. Yeah, I will uh, say that the movie does does seem to do a decent job of, like, pre presenting a nuanced uh, picture of the whole thing where it's yeah. like, we're going to make fun of the fact that people are glued to their cell phones, but at the same time, the thing that, I mean, like, the conversation that Rick has with Mark at the end where he has that great line where he's like, maybe stealing everyone's data and f feeding it to a hyper-intelligent AI <laughs> in order to, as part of an unregulated tech monopoly, was a bad idea. And he's like, yeah, that wasn't your best thought, but then he's like, but it let my daughter make these videos, so yeah. it's like a pretty, it's a good thing also. It, yeah. it, so and it kind of captures both sides. And they only do that like twice in the movie. They yeah. don't really hit you over the head with it, but it is there for the adults yeah. in the room, so it's cool. The only moment I, I hated was when it's like, they're first capturing the humans, and they're like, free Wi-Fi, and all the humans are just like running towards the pods. <laughs> I'm like, that's a little dumb. There are definitely, but it's funny. Yeah, there are definitely parts of this movie where I'm like, okay, I get the joke you're trying to do, it's pretty on the nose and pretty, like, for lack of a better word, cringe, where I'm just like, ah, oh, okay, yeah, I get it. But then a lot of the time, to its credit, it just keeps going with the joke. Like, it, it starts off with a joke, and you're like, I get it, but this isn't this isn't funny to me. But they go through so many permutations of that mm. one joke really quickly that I end up laughing at a lot of them. Yeah. Like what? And a great example is, is, is the end when um, Rick is trying to use the computer, like in the epilogue. And he, he's like, yeah, I've, I've, I'm pretty good with computers now or whatever. And it cuts to him like oh, yeah. screaming and bashing the keyboard. And he's like, ah, blah, blah, blah. crying in the and, corner. And yeah. there are like three or four little like mini skits in that joke. And one of them is him crying in the corner. Yeah, that got and me. And that's where it got yeah, me. Yeah, same. So I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, totally. you got me. But yeah, you're like, right. Because at the first shot cut away, I was like, uh. Yeah. And then it got funnier and funnier. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I, and the same thing yeah. kind of with the robots. They start off being like, okay, we're going to do this like. Oh, hello, fellow humans. But then they keep going with it yeah. and they end up being really funny. I see, thought they were great comic relief. I yeah. like them. I yeah. like, see, I kind of have a more of a bell curve with them where I, I grew to like them very quickly oh, yeah. uh, in the first scene. And I think when they, by the time they like go to the basement and draw on their faces, I was like, yeah, this is funny. <laughs> but then at the end, 
uh, I felt like, I don't know, like the end and end, I didn't enjoy them as much. Like I didn't find them as funny. Oh, really? But I, I do like that they're part of like the main plot that they kind of save the day. I don't know. I don't know. I found a few <laughs> things in this movie. The joke went on too long or sure. came back too many yeah. times. Well, I yeah. agree. During that epilogue, uh, like another montage of him using the computer. I was like, isn't this movie over? What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah. the worst one for me was the the mom. I think the first time she goes like super sane and kills all the robots. It killed me. And the oh, yeah. Kill Bill music comes on and she's like, <laughs> ah. But then the second time it happens, when she comes back and she's flying on the robot, I was like, yeah, yeah. I oh, really? It. I, I get it. I don't know. I just, I completely loved that. I mean, that's that's a exception to this rule that I think I'm talking about where like when she comes back and she's just like a badass warrior, I'm just like, hell yeah, Linda. Like, yeah. I don't know. I was into it. The, but, this is such a funny shot when she's like, she goes insane because it's like mom strength from seeing yeah. her children in danger. And so I think that's kind of funny because we we know that trope, but this is like taking that uh, to the yeah. next level. And so then when she comes or uh, she stabs the robot in the head and like the, the blood goes on her face. It's not well, that's blood, the but first time. I think that whole sequence the yeah. first time is hilarious. Because yeah. yeah, it has two different Kill Bill musical stings. Oh, yeah. And I was yeah. like, yeah, I'm into this. Two Kill Bill references in this movie, hey? <laughs> yeah. And a couple. The first one is the bam, 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 where they're yeah. like gearing up like badass yeah. montage walking. Yeah. And then what was the second one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when you see your enemy da, da, yeah. Da. yeah as as we like to do let's talk about the good stuff yeah. uh for me one of the biggest good points for this movie is the animation oh it's awesome it looks amazing yeah. it's clearly 3d animated but like the textures on everything kind of like so flat well and they seem like hand drawn like there's like yeah. kind of squiggles it's on like stuff like shaded well the, it's, it's it's built on the same lighting engine that into the spider verses and that okay. has such a, a it's the same studio right and so it has like such a comic or like a hand drawn aesthetic yeah and even the little things like the shading isn't like physically based where it's like oh yeah his shoulders there there starts the shading right it's little brush strokes yeah that's that what I'm simulate seeing. That's what I mean. it uh same with like textures on walls like that the planks really stood out to me like in a pixar movie it'd be very re photorealistic planks of wood that are realistically degraded but here it's just like a rectangle with fucking brush strokes on it yeah. and it, it works for what they're going for and i think it's smart to not compete on a technical level with pixar and disney totally but to totally just take it somewhere else and express yourself the using thing the that animation. stood out to me was the Characters' eyes who wear glasses. Mm. Their eyes looked super flat, which kind of makes sense because, like, if, you're, if I'm looking through your at your eyes through glasses, I'm looking at like an abstraction of your eye. They're a little bit enlarged, mm. right, and they're right. they kind of are flatter. Yeah, and they they totally just serve to be like I'm looking at a 2D thing in a 3D world, and it yeah. it looked utterly. Well, you unique. mean they had that same sort of like refraction? Of, no, it's of just the like eyes? an eye was the shape of the. Like glasses. they didn't distort the the glasses didn't distort anything. Is that what you're saying? No, they do. Oh, okay. They make it look they make the eyes look flatter than the rest mm -hmm. of the character, right? And a little bit bigger. Do you guys notice what they were doing with the noses too? Because if you're hand drawing a nose, generally you're only drawing like one side of the nose, right. like where they turn. And they did that in this movie where the nose would be per, like <gasps> rendered to one side, and when the character would switch head, it would flip. What? Like it wasn't like 3D placed. It was like a hand drawn thing in 3D like space. Are you sure? Yeah, yeah, of yeah, side. yeah. yeah. I saw that a couple times. It might not be the entire movie, but I saw I noticed that like several times. Because I yeah, I don't know. I was I was because I was thinking I was actually thinking about their noses because I was like, yo, dad has like a giant hook nose, yeah. and like her nose is also like a little bit hooked, but then uh Katie's nose is like a button th situation where yeah. it scoops the opposite way. I'm like, that's not it might not be all of them. I think it was <laughs> it was the dad where I noticed where it's just like the nose, the nose is 3D space, but there's only the accented uh, like shading on the one side, and then that'll flip when they flip yeah. sides. So it's like it's to simulate right. a hand-drawn effect. Welcome to the nose cast, everybody. I <laughs> thought it was so cool. I think the aesthetic is is really great just on its own. But then when they they incorporate all the, the sci-fi stuff, and they did such a good design on all the sci-fi stuff, like the tractor beam when the robots shoot the tractor beam and catch stuff, it looks so cool. Yeah, it does look really cool. That's or, what's great about the style that these guys use is like. It's almost like mixed media mm. where the, you've got this. It looks hand drawn. This just looks like RTX on. Yeah. Yeah. There's so many little tiny details where you're like, you didn't have to do that. Like the tractor beam the, it's it's a gradient of colors. Yeah. And it's not like it's not like a rainbow situation. It's like it goes. It's like two or three or four colors. Yeah. Well, and it's like polygons on top. And, and so it's using yeah. that to separate the colors. So like, they could so just good. be like, there's a tractor beam. It's yeah. blue. Yep. But they're like, no, we have all this like extra detail yeah. going on. Yeah. Well, and they're at, so artistic. Even the little things, like when they step into the rhombus of infinite subjugation. Oh, the big Ethereum logo? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The big Ethereum it's a great logo. name, first off. But then the lighting, the rules, the properties of the lighting totally yeah. change. And it just has such a different aesthetic. But sometime, somehow they incorporate the 
hand-drawn look of these characters into that space, but they still look out of place. Yeah. Oh, it's man, similar to Saul so in that good. way. Saul had, totally. had this kind of character totally. as well, where they go to different areas and they're the different animation styles. Yeah. Um, but, but this movie also had another layer, which was the editing. Mm. Yeah. Was totally, which was cool because it had harmony with the main character, where suddenly it just... It's like almost like you're watching a YouTube video. It just cuts to something ridiculous or it cuts to a completely different art style. Yeah. And what I thought was really brilliant about it was normally if you're in, watching a movie that has a narrator, in this case it's Katie, you go from I'm watching a movie, which is kind of like I'm omniscient, to oh, it's from this character's perspective. Whoever's right. reading me the story is telling me their perspective. Mm -hmm. And then we get that here with her as the narrator, but the the editing and the like the other like kind of meta visuals that get drawn on top of the movie <laughs> yeah. they yeah. make now I'm like I'm really inside of her head like yeah. I'm really seeing the world the way that she sees it which I thought was really cool I thought that was cool I I, I think that there are some moments where it really really works mm -hmm. but I think most of the time I just thought they were a bit annoying like it was like it was it was visual overload and I think this movie even if it didn't have any of the extra 2D animated stuff like on top of it. Like, you know what I'm talking about, yeah, right? Yeah. Like little cartoons that pop up. Like hearts and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like if, even if it didn't have any of that stuff, it would still be super busy visually. Yeah. And so when that... Like, there are times when I was like, that's that's kind of cool how they did that. But on other times, I'm just like, ah, stop, there's too yeah. much on screen. And I want to look at everything. Uh, maybe this is just like me, like a quirk of my personality. Well, you're millennial. Like, what? You're just a millennial, you know, because... Younger people are as opposed be, to Gen Z. Yeah, they're gonna be like they're used to filters and stuff like that. There's like always, I don't need to analyze the the granularity, the the tiny details of things. It's just like it's it's here and it's gone. No, you're too you're too slow I'm to appreciate all the stuff. <laughs> That's definitely me and as a person, not necessarily all millennials. <laughs> yeah. But like for me as a person, for sure, like things pop up and I'm like, this is cool. I want to see all of it, but then it's gone before I can like even see what it was. I think though that's the stuff that like you'll I'm sure kids are going to love this movie and yeah. want to rewatch it and that's the stuff they'll catch more and more as you keep rewatching. You'll notice little extra animations like the dog with the long hair like kicking its legs in the corner and stuff. Yeah. Like there's lots of little gags that work. And, they and could, I, I think I feel like it could be good for rewatching for kids. Totally. Cuz then they're like they kind of get to know the little animations. Like the one that the one that I'm thinking of is at the end when uh Katie's driving the car into the lair for the second time. Yeah. Uh, or well for the first anyways whatever. Yeah, she's yeah, driving yeah. the car in the layer using Munchie as a distraction and beside the car in the tunnel there are these like like dogs running but they're switching between dogs and pigs and loaves of bread oh yeah, yeah so it's yeah. like a little animated creature That's running and it's, it's, it's like dog pig lo loaf of bread dog pig yeah. and it's cycling between them and it's like you know it's like a four second shot yeah. or whatever but like you so much. i didn't see it until i went back and watched it again i, I was like wait what that was there the that's whole time hilarious. i saw it i love that yeah and it's that's yeah. that's a that's an example where i'm like that's kind of a cool little background yep. detail but like there are other times where i'm like yeah stop yeah i found like they do the meme stuff a few a oh bit too gosh. much and some of it is i think it's the stuff that feels old that works the least well like I think the first time that it cuts between the dad and the screaming, howling Kill monkey me. was kind of funny. Kill me. But then they returned to that oh, joke, and I'm like, it wasn't that funny the first time. It's not great in your, like, climax moment. I hated that. Yeah, I was like, okay. Because, like, we're starting off with this, like, I bet you're wondering how I got into this situation. Like, it's yeah. like a crazy, crazy time, and the robots are already here, and then we're going to do a flashback back. Hated it. And in the middle of this, like, crazy, crazy intro to the whole movie, we're like, my dad kind of seems like that YouTube video of that Gibbon. Remember that yeah, YouTube video yeah. here? Let me show you this YouTube video. It's really funny. I'm sure yeah. you'll like it. Like it's like it reminded me of somebody saying, "Here's a funny YouTube video." And every time someone does that, you're like, "This isn't that funny." Well, it was just very <laughs> 2008 YouTube, yeah, not like 2021. And I think most of this movie is very good at feeling like this is very 2021. Yeah. This is very contemporary. But some of the stuff, I'm like, "Oh, these are 40 year olds that designed this meme." Every <laughs> single time they put the cat filter on someone's face where it's like yeah. meow 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 it's like why well, we could have done times, without this a couple times it was funny i think the one where they have the filters on their face but they're all different and they're like meme faces and that one returns that i one think that funny. one was kind of funny yeah i okay one more about the meme faces though there, there's a lot of visual <laughs> gags in this movie that like aren't a line but it's just like you just see it and it's funny and the first one that, that i'm thinking of is they're at the dinosaur place and it pans up to reveal the head of the brontosaurus. And he's oh. like, Aaron is upset that they're not scientifically accurate. And it pans up to the head of the brontosaurus. And it's like, it's, it does not look like, like a dinosaur like head a at all. It just looks like a cartoon man yeah. or something. Yeah, I laughed out loud. That was that. so funny. And then when the robots uh, show up and they text the people and they're like, please obey the robots. Uh, oh, yeah. Please do not resist the robots that are just arriving. And then it's like three thumbs up emojis. I was yeah. like, ah, that's funny. This 
this movie is laugh out loud funny. I don't yeah. know if you guys found it yourself. I found myself having big laughs often. Right. Yeah, I think it's because of the the way they hit you. A lot of them mm. are so abrupt that they're yeah. they're like spit your drink out kind of funny. <laughs> yeah. like, you don't you don't see any of them coming. Yeah. Oh my god, yeah. the the montage at the first part when they're like road tripping and it's getting better and they're kind of like hitting their stride, but then they're like going up the Grand Canyon or whatever on the donkeys and then there's just the shot of the donkey drowning. <laughs> like, oh, that, yeah, that was the next what? level. Yeah. Like a lot of a lot of movies wouldn't have done any kind of animal harm at all. Yeah. Like what about Seabiscuit or whatever yeah, his name yeah. is? They're like, he's the rivers now. <laughs> <laughs> like, and the giant Furby it didn't get me right away, but I, it fucking got to me at Yo. some point. When it's like, I will avenge my fallen children. <laughs> okay, I was going to ask you guys, because I watched it with subtitles. So, yeah. like, all those lines, all his... All, his, all the Furby the lines have Furby. subtitles. Yeah, okay. They were God, so funny. So I will avenge my... Yeah, the, the pain only makes me stronger. <laughs> <laughs> so... I don't think I saw those. Oh, really? Oh, really? Oh, man, I missed out. Yeah, like, it's funny. When they... That was a cool moment. Like, the when they show the Furbies... I, I usually don't love when they have these like explicit pop culture references yeah. in a movie like this because I'm like make your own thing you know like but I thought the the fact that it was Furbies was was really funny because it was like the the sounds of them for real yeah. like, it was like well and then when they like start like jumping off the 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 bridges and then killing themselves you're like what is going on they're like oh, the call the elder yeah and then so then at that point I'm like. Okay, the big Furby, I'm like, this doesn't, this isn't this a thing. Is silly, yeah. But then it starts shooting lasers. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, this is fully jump the shark. Yeah. Like, we're in a movie with a robot apocalypse where yeah. they're like flying all over the globe and yeah. dude, like things are crazy, but this is like, that takes it too far. But even yeah. in that scene, it starts with like, oh, we're now getting attacked not by robots, but by just our internet connected home appliances. Yeah. That's kind of Which funny. is like, an, like kind of a wink, like, why do we have right. a fridge with the Wi-Fi? Yeah. And I actually thought that was one of the best scenes in the movie, the, this whole mall sequence. Yeah. So it goes from that groundedness yeah. to all the way to like, now <laughs> we're just fighting Furbies, but I guess they, maybe they have an, a chip in them or maybe they have some kind of function. <laughs> sure. Like yeah. the toaster is toasting things at me and like popping them, but then you get to the giant Furby, it's like, they obviously don't have lasers. <laughs> <laughs> they never had a giant one and never had lasers, but it doesn't matter. It's so funny because on one level I was annoyed where I'm like, that's stupid. But at the at the same time, it was so funny. The yeah. fact that this like, <laughs> it was Mike Rianda, the director, who also voices Aaron, the kid. But oh, we'll, nice. we'll talk about that. Uh, doing the voice of the big, ju of all the Furbies. <laughs> and so like, you have the subtitles saying things like, let the dark harvest begin. And the, and the, and the Furby's like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like you can't not laugh. Yeah. It's uh even though I'm like annoyed at the lasers. I don't yeah. know. It was great. Um I like too that they 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 set up the her Mimi YouTube channel and that's what saves the day in the end is her like right. creativity and her connectiveness to the internet. Yeah. Uh and it's f it's kind of funny the first time you see it. I think like all those videos are actually really clever where I'm like <laughs> Oh, those are like really inspired. Like they're not just like <laughs> they could have done the, a bare minimum to be like, yeah, she's a film. She wants to be a film student. She's doing her thing. Yeah. But they really went the extra mile to make them like really have a spark of energy. I, do I really, really enjoy them. I really enjoy how the how her creative style is like you like you were saying, James, it was it's like exhibited in the movie. Mm -hmm. So we feel like there is more of a connection to her. And and we get it's almost like the movie itself and the, the style in which is presented is it like reflects on her character. In some respects, that's the most characterization we get from her. It's more visual. Yeah. Mm. Like we're, we're almost shown more than told in yeah, that I way. I guess so. I mean, I don't know. I, I can understand. There's a certain yeah. amount of like uh, leniency that I extend to movies when they don't characterize kids a ton. Because I'm like, they have growing up to do and maturing to do and they don't even know who they are yet. You know, she's just going to film school for the, like she, she I'm assuming she just graduated high school and now she's going to film, like college for the first time. So I'm like, you probably, you, you know, on some level, you don't even know who you are, really. You know that you're this, like, quirky person and you're creative and you want to do this stuff. But, like, she doesn't she doesn't realize the power of, of family and the, and the value of that and, like, the fact that her parents have gone through this stuff. She doesn't understand the broader world and, like, her place in it and the context. So I, I think it has more to do with the fact that she's the audience surrogate. Mm. Like, in, it's probably a kid. If a movie is starring a kid, it's usually a kid's movie. The kid wants to embody that protagonist. Because mm. right. then you've got characters like her little brother mm. where... You know, like I've said before, like if you saw his words on the page, you would know it was him. If you heard Justice's voice and didn't see him, you'd know it was him. Just the way he's always, the way he talks frenetically and right. the, the things he talks about, Definitely. they're all very Aaron. That's yeah. true. Yeah, she's are... more, she's kind of a little more blank slatey. Right. 
at, at any one time, you're not entirely sure what she's going to say because it seems like she goes from being like, oh, I'm, a, I'm an angsty teenager to being like, no, this is something we have to do and I'm an adult now. I think, though, that's like the, the, the pleasure of coming of age stories is that like it's such a broad net and it laser focus. And that's how we are. It's like we're... We're, like you said, we're figuring out who we are and then we kind of arrive at like what we're growing up to be. And yeah. that's why coming of age stories really work in movies is that it's such a broad broad net to capture everyone because everyone can fit into that broad area. Right. And then the movie kind of arrives at a spot where she's more defined. And I think it works really well for me. Like I, yeah. I like her as a character quite a bit. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I found her endearing. I, I liked the journey, uh, like the core moral message here, yeah. which is that like people are different, relationships are hard, they take work, you know, and I think... Sp- particularly for children, you know, it's hard for them to understand what their parents are trying to do and the difficulties and trials that they've gone through in their life. And like, so when you're a kid, you only focus on your like, yeah. life is so hard for me. My parents are just there to help me or to make things harder. Yeah. They don't understand what's going on with my life. But That's it's like, fair. they've gone through their whole journey just to get you here. And I liked that. I liked that. I, I, mean, I Particularly I, as a parent, becoming oh, a parent yeah. recently, I'm like, Dang, I wonder if my kid's going to... I mean, he's definitely he's not going to understand that uh, right away, but, like, yeah. you know, I'm going to go through this. Yeah, it's fair. I think that I like that journey that the movie goes on, but it takes its sweet time to get going. Yeah. And it's... it's at, the first 30 minutes are so overly familiar. It's like, okay, like, a kid and their parent not communicating. Like, right. one's caught in the old ways, one's caught in the new ways. Like, that. that's a story that's been told a million times. It's a goofy movie. Ex- literally a goofy movie <laughs> is, is the first 30 minutes of this movie. Yeah. And it's fine but i felt very frustrated by the first 30 minutes that the mitchells aren't versus the robots until literally like 2850 or whatever <laughs> yeah i think it's i clicked got... on this thumbnail because there were robots well, no it's just like it's 30 minutes of like totally normal road trip yeah, stuff yeah. and it just felt like i think once the movie gets going i i love it right. but there's like a whole quarter of this movie is so generic and boring i felt that as well and i think it has to do with the dual story setup they're doing because mm. in a lot of movies the like the inciting action that kicks off the story has to do with the characters you're looking at. You know, it's like like Thelma and Louise, like they're gonna go. The inciting action is they're gonna go on a vacation, and then they leave on their vacation, and uh, they act- they murder a man, and then now they're on the run, and then now we're in Act Two. Mm-hmm. But in this movie, uh, the inciting incident is kind of there's two. It's like the family is gonna go on, on a road, road trip. trip, and in parallel. The robots are taking over. Yeah. So you've got to build those both up, and then you've got to make them merge, and it That's just kind of took longer. I think for me, the I, I agree, and I think like it's hard to do what they did and set it up more efficiently. I I think the the family stuff is, yeah, it's just so familiar that it, mm. they I think they could have used more shorthand to get it across yeah. more efficiently. And and sometimes, and this is what I was saying about how like you, there's moments that are amazing, but then there's lots of like kind of infill that are, is just like meh. Yeah. There's, particularly in that first act. They're driving in the car and they're trying to crack jokes, but um, they're not landing for me. Yeah. They're, they're trying to have like heartstring pulling. And it's just not pulling on anything. It's just meh. Yeah, the, yeah. I hate I hate when movies use pop songs uh, as a main. <laughs> view. And this movie uses a lot, and some of them I think are very effective. But yeah. the the so live your life. Yeah. I was yeah. so disappointed. Was like, Maya, uh, he. They yeah, started yeah. with the Maya he, and I, I was know, like, that's, yeah, hell yeah. That's like <laughs> if you're just doing the original like Numa Numa, yeah, or whatever, yeah. 2006 We're kind of stuff. We're too old. We're too old. But of course, it would go into that other version the of it. The Rihanna one. That makes yeah. sense, I guess. But I was disappointed. Lauren was like, oh, this makes me feel so old that that was her like little kid <laughs> <laughs> song. It's like, didn't that didn't that just come out? <laughs> yeah, so like, so live your life. But it's, it's not like, a bad. Song. It's just one of those things where it's like, it just takes you out of the universe of the movie more yeah. than I think other musical cues did. And like, how but can it, you fight while yeah. singing this song? I, I hate that, man. Well, it's, it's like, yeah, oh, it's, when I say he, that's when I'm gonna slash this guy yeah. while riding a surfboard that's powered by a severed android arm. That yeah. bit didn't bother me too much because I'm like, it's a Phil Lord Christopher Miller thing. Like, sure. the, by the by, the time you're in the climax, you've suspended all disbelief about what is physically possible for these heroes but to accomplish. Phil Lord and Chris Miller, they're only the producers, right? It's the uh, guys from Gravity Falls. Yeah, and I think that's Alex cool. Hirsch. It's not Alex Hirsch. Well, it's he, the creative director. He was a he was a consultant on ah. it, and you get I, and I, the creator of creative director is the one of the main writers yeah, and yeah. Director. no no i'm saying alex oh, hirsch was the creator. main guy between be, behind um galaxy or what's the name gravity, <laughs> gravity falls. falls gravity falls but then these guys were like writers on yeah. it yeah one was creative director one yeah. was a writer mike randa and jeff and you Rowe. can see a lot of that influence in this not only just in like the style and the aesthetic but uh in the way that the first season is nothing it's all about the second <laughs> season <laughs> uh, I um 
going back to like the first act and how it kind of felt weird to not have the robots until later or whatever. I feel like that's why they did this like in media's res like uh, we're, we're, we're starting with the robot craziness and then we're going to cut back. Just so you know, the robots are coming. You got to do that. That's what yeah. they do that in Get Out as well. Oh, yeah. Right? The first scene of Get Out is when there's a guy walking in the neighborhood and then a car pulls up. Right. And then there's like some spooky stuff. I'm not going to spoil that movie. I but, th- but like I, I if like you didn't, better. you be- kind of got to do that because if you don't have that opening scene, then it's just the opening scene Literally is like nothing. a guy and his girlfriend at their house being like, we're going to go on a trip. And then they go and they drive to the parents' house and they're on a trip. But you got to be like, yo, guys, you're in a horror movie. Yeah. So let, yeah. Just so you know, if you walked into the wrong theater, you're in a horror movie. I mean, it's coming later. I I could go either way. I, there's a part of me that thinks the movie would be better if they didn't have that at all. And just kind of like let us get to the crazy robot apocalypse naturally, because like the overall trajectory of this movie already without like without the crazy robot thing in the <laughs> beginning, their overall trajectory is from pretty normal to like super crazy giant Furby with lasers to like, oh my gosh, we're flying through the air. We're superheroes like going crazy. <laughs> so it's like, I don't know. I could have, would have, I would have liked to have that like trajectory uh, naturally happen yeah. without like pushing it in my face. They're like, don't worry, we're going to get to crazy robot fights. Um, I feel like the get out thing was good because it doesn't fully give away what the, what the vibe is going to be. Like, it's like something is, something is weird here. So mm-hmm. I feel like, uh, uh, an analog in this movie would be like showing the robot factory or something and some, something goes evil. Right, but in this case, we've got like freeze frame on the car in midair. Like, <laughs> this is my crazy family. Yeah. We're so eccentric. I We're so you're weird. Won- yeah, I bet you're wondering how I got here. <laughs> That's another, okay. It, it's almost just like a, a signal that your act one is weak. Yeah. Right. Like, why didn't you just make it good enough to hook us? Yeah. That's fair. That's also, uh, yeah. That's and it, fair. And that, that's another problem with the beginning thing is that it h- knocks you over the head with this we're weird thing um, when we haven't really seen them be that weird. No. You know, you're in, you're in a car chase with robots. Obviously, you're going to be yelling all over the place and being crazy. That's not like an example of how weird you are, you know? <laughs> the, the, the primary, yeah. the thing, uh, they didn't seem very weird to me this entire movie. No. The, on, the, the, the one time where I was like, that's that, that works as a demonstration that you're weird compared to other families is when they're in the the roadside thing and the robots attack and the posies have this perfect yeah. thing and they do yoga and get into their car and drive away in a like that. perfect formation and they try to do the same thing and they completely fall on their face didn't, and it's, didn't love that. Well, I thought it was funny. I like when the 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 good family like huddles together and they're like I love you so much. <laughs> <laughs> and they try to do the same thing they're like yeah, you're pretty you're, yeah, you're, you're great. Pretty good. Yep, I like good you. job. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I the interesting funny. thing about the posies is that they're they're not just perfect when you view them online. They're perfect in real life, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not like they were taking a beautiful photo, and then as soon as the camera went away, they, like, slapped the kid across the head. That's what I expected, like and I'm glad it wasn't that, that simple. Oh, really? Yeah. I expected it to be, like, a social media family that were really rude to each other when they're not in front of a camera. Yeah, I guess so. That that does make the... That makes the comparison stronger, that they... It's John Legend and Chrissy Teigen and Charlene Yee. Sure. I don't know who that is. That she's, like, a comedian. Oh, okay. She's been in a few things. We don't know. See you later. <laughs> hey, what, what was the deal? With, I'm pretty. I just have a note that's written here that says magnetic link activated, and I think that refers to like their car was driving up something vertical. Yeah. Oh but, yeah, and then it was falling off. And, and then, then it said it, magnetic link activated, and they kept driving. Yeah. And I was like, who, who that, did that? So that wasn't their car. That was the pod. No, no, no. The car r- drives up at one it, time. It does. It does. But the the car gets all the way to the top. No. I but think, who's activating this link? Listen, this is what I'm saying. I think your your note is re- is related to the fact that when they're in the pod, they only go upward, and the magnetic link uh, keeps integrity when he's pushing the lever forward, and then he stops pushing the lever forward, and then it loses integrity and they fall. But when she's driving the car, there's no like she's just going forward, and there's nothing like it's not clear why the car keeps the magnetic link and the other one doesn't. No, but it do- it doesn't though. It goes and then it loses it, and then it- electricity grabs it and pulls it back. Yeah, I just don't know why that part was. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. what I'm saying though. Yeah. Because the electricity <laughs> no, but, didn't grab the pod then, and pull it back. They just fell. You're, uh, you're missing one part in there. But I, I don't know any who's you're activating missing a part it. part of your brain. We don't, we don't know who's activating it. I don't think it. this is fun for people listening. But <laughs> no. I, just thought that, I was like, what the hell just happened in that spot? A part yeah. that I liked was when uh, Bowman, uh, and as an aside, that's a, that's a 2001 Space Odyssey reference. There's two of those I noticed. Oh. When the robots first become sentient or they start doing their own thing, it cuts... To the very next scene, the blue Danube is playing. Oh, yeah. It's just like yep. 2001 Space Odyssey. Same things happens. And then I noticed that uh, like 
person who creates these robots, that CEO dude, his name is Bowman is the last name. Right. That Dave Bowman is the oh. is the astronaut. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't even look on IMDb for this trivia, boys. Nice. Wow. Nice. Okay, anyway, nice when, when Bowman is getting subjected to the revenge of Pal when she gets a robot to like swipe his face, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that yeah. was awesome. That was really funny. I thought that was kind of funny. I, I like know. that a lot. It kind, I, of, I, it kind of bothered me from like a technical standpoint because I'm like, she can't feel any of that. This isn't an this is an analogous. Well, yeah. it's interesting <laughs> because if you come from the philosophy of Toy Story, Disney and Pixar always thought um, the the uh, the essence of one of these objects. Great, uh, would bring it like great joy. So, for example, if if it's a lamp, the essence of the lamp is to shine light. The essence of the toy is to be played with. Right. So, the if it gets used for the function it was created for, that brings it joy. We're getting so real deep. That means that in this movie, <laughs> you would think if they had the Toy Story philosophy, then Pal would like getting swiped. Right. Because yes. it is the the phone's essence to be swiped. Exactly. But in this case, she hates it. There's a there's a. Yeah, and I I can see that, and it also bothered me because Pal is an AI assistant, so she isn't technically confined to the phone. But oh. it, the the movie acts as if the phone is her body, and yeah. she like doesn't exist just out in the internet somewhere. Yeah, she doesn't have they don't have Google and Home. They, they kill her by dropping Mark <laughs> Bowman's phone into a glass of water. Which a you know we're in the tech sphere. We know that most phones, most flagship phones nowadays are waterproof. Well, didn't it bounce off the cement first too? No, it bounced off uh, Munchie. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, it, that's the sequel, Riley. She's like, haha, I was in a cloud, in yeah, the, cloud the whole time, obviously. I don't want them to make a sequel. Just make a different thing. Just make a different, yeah. make a different thing. I, like, I want this creative energy, but yeah. this story is told. This family's story is told. And I do appreciate, like, I, I want to compare this to Spider-Verse because Spider-Verse has a similar amount, maybe a bit less, of, like, the extra animated uh, stuff. Like, Spider-Verse is trying to look like a comic book, so we have this, like, you know, uh, what do you call it? An onomatopoeia of text mm -hmm. appearing on screen, like, going between shots and stuff, and that's cool. Um, but Spider-Verse had worked a lot better for me. It seems like it's more natural. It's the same thing we're talking about with Scott Pilgrim, where because it seems more naturally integrated into the medium that we're looking at, uh, it, 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 doesn't bother, it, it doesn't bother me as much, and it also... Um, I don't know. It seems more natural. Are you talking about like when there's a collision of different <clears throat> art styles? It made sense because that had unity with the story about different dimensions merging. No, no. I I think that Spider Verse has a consistent like comic booky aesthetic. There are parts where it, it's got these like little color dots and stuff, just like a comic comic book, and that automatopoeia I'm talking about. And in this one, we have the automatopoeia is like when it says an explosion happens like, and then the text boom, boom comes yeah, up. Yeah, yeah, something like that. And in this one. We have a ton of extra stuff, and we talked already about how it's consistent with our character, and we kind of like feel like we're watching her creative thing. But at the same time, it's 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 still extra, and I'm like, you don't need this. It's completely unnecessary. It's not adding much. Yeah, I think that this movie is not as interested in building out a universe. I think it's it's more interested in its, in its moment to moment. Yeah, and that's both a good and a bad thing because I think the moment to moment of this movie is very very fun, but it doesn't have the weight or the the like longevity I think of an Into the Spider Verse. Right, because yeah, Into the Spider Verse doesn't ever sacrifice its believability for a joke. It doesn't like right. give up its magic for like a simple moment. Yeah. And there's like silly moments, like Spider Pig and stuff is like goofy as fuck. <laughs> but uh, it all fits into building the universe. Whereas right. I think in the in the Mitchells, there's a lot of like, hey, we're gonna put a joke in, and like it kind of doesn't make sense, but like, yeah. it's funny. I think that well, oh you're just gosh. you're aiming at two different goals there. Mm. On the one, you've got the gravity of having. To carry on this legacy of a character that's decades old that's and has right. seen so many different permutations and you're trying to be original and like respect it and honor it. <gasps> Whereas in this one, it's like if especially if it's just planned to be a one off, it's like mm. let's just make it a roller coaster yeah. ride as best as we can. And it's literally just like it's a cartoon. Mm -hmm. And I think you you give it the benefit of that, of that doubt where in in Spider-Verse they kind of explain in, in terms of some of the characters, they're like, they're from an alternate universe and that universe has different rules. So like Spider-Pig can pull out a giant hammer or something and that's totally fine because we're like, he's from that universe. We, we don't see characters from the main universe doing that because they can't. Uh, but in this show, it's like, yeah, Rick can ride two robots, uh, you know, in, in midair while firing a laser thing. It's like, yeah, yeah sure, why not? Because it's a cartoon. It, we, we don't yeah. have any of those rules we really need to observe. While we're nitpicking, how about the fact that the midpoint of the movie is like they're trying to destroy all the robots by uploading, like flashing the BIOS or whatever they're doing. Right? They're trying to upload a virus <laughs> switch, yeah, yeah. into into this laptop, and then because the Wi-Fi dies, 
they so can, the upload stops. Well, you don't so like go, just fucking drive to a McDonald's, man. Exactly. Like, just, go to anywhere like, else. Oh, yeah. There's Wi-Fi. The internet's done. Therefore, we must go to Silicon Valley yeah. and take a different approach to yeah. destroy it. It's like, well, well why didn't, don't you just need internet again that's somehow? Yeah. And if you oh. have to, and if it can't be just internet, it has to be a PAL one. Like they they said before this, there's like thousands of malls, there's thousands of PAL right. stores across the country. And like I get it, they have to go to the like the OG spot because like that's a better climax. But yeah, they need to explain it away. Like you see, pal, shut down the other stores, yeah. shut down the internet, like make it well, impossible. I think later in the all is lost moment, they actually had someone step on the flash drive, like they yeah. broke it. They should have just done that in the mall. Okay, but, but except, except the other, the other, they was, can make another they USB. They can make another USB. Yeah. Okay. I like, thought that was a funny thing to do because I'm like, okay, well, he just stuck that out his finger, like he can make another one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, why not go back to Pal who's like, oh, that's what they're trying to do. Now yeah, they can no longer do that. Do, yeah. I think that's a plot hole, boys. Um, we found yeah, it. Let's we... email Sony Pictures. Phil Miller. Which is an, an interesting... <laughs> Filler. <laughs> Filler. <laughs> which is an interesting thing, actually, because this is a Sony movie, but it came to Netflix. I think that's they part sold, of a they, deal. They sold the rights because they knew they weren't going to get their money back in theaters. Oh. So they sold it to Netflix for $110 million. Oh, uh, so this is this wait, is a full Sony anim- animated feature. I don't remember whether on the movie it says Sony animation. It does. Yeah. Oh, okay. And then and, Sony camera, her camera oh, from childhood. <laughs> it, there's a shot where it's in the foreground, but kind of just bulk it out. Yeah. Oh, and you can just Do you think a kid would want to use a DV tape camera over a cell phone? That I was like, there are I a bunch get of it. weird things in this because they they want to make it feel more analog. Like it's like Be Kind Rewind, where they have to remake all the movies, yeah. uh, and the stuff. And, and like, I wish this movie had more of that. I wish this movie had her remaking movies like throughout. I think they could have done like more fun stuff with that. But uh, yeah, why why is she using a DV tape camera? You know what? Now that I think about it, I I like that because it's it's the family camera. You know, I think that she could use her phone, but I think that her being like a film person, she's probably more like, you know. It, it's a DV like camera. It's not. It's not like film, but like it's a bit more related to the. It's like uh, the 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 purity yeah, the of analog, using yeah, like yeah. a film camera. I can yeah. see it. You yeah, can hand wave fair. that for you, me. That's huh? fair. That's sure. Fair. Sure. <laughs> so, what about the final scene where we find out that she's gay? Ooh, I like that. I, I think it's important when things are just like don't make a big deal about it because I think like the movie could have been all like pat back padding and been like, yeah. oh, we made like a, a main character that's gay, but instead they're just like. It's totally normal yeah. like, that there is a gay character. I actually thought it okay before the reveal at the end when they were just showing like oh I'm friends um, I have friends my people over there at school and the one I'm interacting most with is Jade. I actually kind of thought there was a, that was coded as queer. I kind of mm-hmm. oh yeah I kind of already read it that way. And then when they they actually say it explicitly at the end, I thought oh well that's totally cool. Uh, did they have to say it explicitly? And then I realized I think they kind of. Had to because yeah. otherwise, what is the diversity budget in this movie? Yeah, they, there's like because <laughs> yeah. the movie has almost no side characters, right? That yeah. are human except for Bowman. Yeah, and they made so okay. He's a person of color, but he's also evil. Yeah, like he like he he oh, he's, no. he's Lando, right? It cancels yeah. it out. It, it More, does. Yeah. It's like Lando Calrissian. It's like the only black guy in Star right. Wars is evil yeah. or is a traitor. So he doesn't count. So then the, not in the long run, but yeah, I take your point. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> So Continue. then they're like, okay, we need to, uh, we have this, for, for whatever reason, the Mitchells, they're just like a, you know, they're a white family. Well, okay, so on one level- I don't know I if they're like, based on real people, like from the credits, are. it kind of looks like they, they are. are. Yeah. They are, yeah, yeah. Uh, on the one level, I was like, okay, she's clearly co- coded as as queer from the get-go. There's multiple like rainbow things going on. She's got a rainbow pin on her, the entire uh, thing. Uh, uh, they have a rainbow, um, whatever you call it plate on their on, at their home so i was kind of like oh, okay she's probably a lesbian um and then she says it explicitly at the end and i i do think that they have to say that uh okay well maybe not a lesbian like bisexual i don't know whatever she's queer and i don't i do think they have to say it because there are going to be a lot of like really you know just middle america people watching this and and i even though that all that stuff is there and we notice it super easily i think that's there's going to be a lot of people get to the end and be like oh well, my kids just watched this. Yeah. Oh my god. I don't think it's that. I think it's just that they would get backlash for not being inclusive enough if they didn't have it. Yeah, it could be because, like, Who yeah, because otherwise it's just like, what is this movie from yeah. the '90s? I will say, <laughs> I will say, there is an element where I'm like, th- th- there's a part of me that thinks this is, it's, it's sort of annoyed by this because they're like, we're such a weird family, we're so quirky and blah blah blah, and because. They're not that weird. Like up to They're not that weird. The, something that bothered me about the movie was the the description of them as being this like crazy eccentric and weird family. And the the weirdest, I mean, the, the most non normal <laughs> thing about them is the fact that she's queer. No, it's it's not that kind of weird. It's the moose calls in public. 
It's well, not... I guess so, but like I don't know. I feel like that's pretty normal, and maybe that's it's normal for cartoon dads. Maybe. Well, maybe yeah, and maybe it's because like my family is whatever weird, quote unquote. But like I feel like there are so many families that we've seen in American uh, media that are like this, and they're not like described as like being super super weird. But maybe we're getting too granular with this. Like I think they're they're weird enough, I guess, for the uh, compared to the like general social norm of like a functional family yeah on the uh, i totally agree i think on the uh the grand scale of weirdness where like there's normie and like there's like freak they're uh they're not quite weird they're like quirky they're yeah. kooky they're kooky. kooky yeah kooky one level down they're creepy and they're kooky <laughs> no just the second one <laughs> funny joke was when um <laughs> there's like i forget what the setup was but there's like a photo there's like a nice smiling photo of some family. It's like, oh, that photo came with the frame. And then it cuts and shows the photo. <laughs> and it's like a photorealistic <laughs> live action. Family, like, yeah. That's yeah. like South Park kind of. Yeah, that's pretty hilarious. Funny. That was really funny. I liked how it started. Like right when the movie starts off, it shows a bunch of real life footage of, of families doing family stuff. And I'm like, this is kind of fun. Yeah. And it kind of is mirrored at the very end uh, in the credits. They show all of the crew. Like, I guess they asked the cast and crew and everyone to submit photos of them with their family. And I thought that was kind of nice because it kind of like re like under underlines the the core premise of the movie, which is that like, hey, families are weird and can be dysfunctional and messed up, but like, there's value there, and they, you know, they, there's some good times. And I was like, okay, that's cool. You know, what was also cool about that aspect of it was the fact that there's scenes for of both Katie and her dad taking a deep breath and and trying to be understanding. Right. Like the mom's coaching the dad, and Aaron's coaching Katie to be like, no, no, hear him out, do your best. Yeah, it's not just that your dad needs to change and understand you better. Is that you need to change too? Right. It takes work work from both parties. Yeah, I nobody's like perfect. I think. Yeah, I, I appreciate that as well. I think a lot of time with movies, they have, uh, they don't remember to make every single character have flaws that they need to overcome, and 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 I think they do a good job in this movie, particularly mm. when, uh, you know, um, he's trying to talk to her and Linda's holding up signs and he's just oh, reading yeah. off the sign because initially they ask they ask something of the other. And and their initial reaction is to be like, ooh, that makes me uncomfortable. And so I'm going to make this awkward. And anytime you do that, it causes tension and conflict. So that is just like a reminder that like, hey, instead of uh, giving into this first impulse you have, which is that this is awkward and uncomfortable, I don't want to do it, blah, 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 you just kind of like go into this animalistic state of like, ah, flight or fight. Um, just like take a second, breathe, realize that it's not going to be the end of the world and just do it, you know? Yeah, take a stick shift left in from your dad. That was a weird time to do it. It was a really dumb. That was a dumb. <laughs> it was a dumb time to yeah. do it in the movie. But the lesson was there, and I was like, okay, I appreciate that. That's fine. What do you guys think of the cast? Because like it's clearly <laughs> they 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 got. I think everyone is very good for the role, but they're all very recognizable voices. Like I think the one that stood out to me the most is Danny McBride. I had See, the opposite so experience. Yeah, me really. too. I saw it before we covered the movie. I was like, oh, sick. Danny McBride's in this movie. He's hilarious. And then <laughs> after the movie ended, I was like. Oh yeah, that was supposed to be Danny McBride. I didn't even notice. Just it's a very not Danny McBride role. Generic dude voice. Oh really? Voice. Oh, I, it like totally was. Oh like, really? I could only. Well, hear. he's usually like a mischief ship disturber, anti-hero kind of yeah. guy. Yeah, and he usually has like a southern accent. And he's like, "Oh, this is my hat now. This is yeah. totally my hat." <laughs> um, and in this one, he was like, "I did not recognize it yeah. until afterwards." I looked up, and he's like, "Oh, that was Danny McBride." I mean, Maya Rudolph's voice is pretty recognizable. recognizable as uh, Linda, but it works for I me. I thought that she one... was underutilized because like. Her as the hormone monster in oh, Big Mouth, so good. She's like an amazing talent. Like yes. the Maya singing Rudolph, she can do and everything. My Rudolph is amazing in literally everything she does. And, I don't think there's one thing of hers that I don't like. And this it was just like, nah, yeah. just I, I think is it Abby Jacobson. Yeah, she's she's great. I think she's a good choice for that role. She was. I what has she been in? I don't. Uh, I don't recognize. I know her, her from all. Broad City. Oh, okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She's that lady. Yep. Yeah, yeah. She's I funny, her now. and yeah. I think she she works well for that role. Brings yeah. a lot of. She brings the edge that you need. And like occupies that role and makes it like a yeah. full person. Eric Andre was fun as Mark Bowman. He's underutilized in my opinion. He Eric was. Andre is so bonkers. Who's that? Yeah. Oh wait, wait, wait! Is he that guy from Adult Swim? Yeah, yeah. With, it has like that like uh, talk show. Yeah, that guy's hilarious. Yeah, he's so funny, and, and he, he he does like a pretty straight edge or a straight character here. Like yeah. Um, and I I kind of liked it actually because I don't know I was it was cool for me to hear Eric Andre doing something that wasn't like. I'm gonna poop in your mouth. Yeah. God. <laughs> like, Have you guys watched this movie? <laughs> no, it's I, wa I kind of want so to. So cringe. Is I, it? I I get a very physical reaction to cringe humor, and that is like <laughs> the whole point is that it's like him in terrible situations. Like 
It's like he's, half he's kind of Borat. -y. The, kind of like Borat, but like there's no point except for suffering. <laughs> <laughs> like I'll spoil the first joke is him. He's like working at a car detailer and people will come up and like he'll have a conversation with them and it's just hidden camera. So he's like having conversation with real people. But then the scripted part is that his high school fling or the girl he loved in high school shows up yeah. and walks into the store and he like freaks out. He's like, oh my God, that's like Cynthia or whatever. Like, I love her. I, oh man, I can't believe it. Oh, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. But then he goes into the car and the vacuum sucks his clothes off. <laughs> so he's fully naked. <laughs> and he's like, dude, you have to cover for me. And then the girl will come out and interact with the person he was interacting with. Yeah. But he's like fully nude hiding in a person's car. She, she's not in on this. She doesn't know that he's going to be there. She knows. But the, the person that he's talking to oh, okay. doesn't know that Man. that's a scripted thing. Like, so it's funny, but it's like I think that unbearably that, cringy. That, that brand of humor can really go either way. Like sometimes it's the funniest thing I've ever seen. And sometimes I'm just like, this it doesn't even take any sort of intelligence or like any sort of creativity at all. You're just being weird just and gross. Bravery. And but like there are some clips of the Eric Andre show that I like are my favorite comedy, like moments of comedy ever. Like where he's just like, just, he destroys his desk and the, <laughs> the guest, you never know whether the guest is in on it or yeah. not because they're just like, what is happening? And it always just cuts back to that guy who's hanging from his piercings, <laughs> like on those hooks. That show's absurd. And Hannibal Buress is a sidekick oh, and he's just Hannibal like also Buress. super. Okay, anyways, anyways, back they, to this movie. They underutilize him in this movie. I guess so. I but don't know. I think it's, you're right. It's kind of refreshing to have him be just like, a normal character. Yeah, I think that was like a twist where I was like, <laughs> <laughs> the movie is so crazy and hitting you with all this crazy stuff all the time and then we cut to Eric Andre's character and he's just a normal person. Yeah. I don't know. I think I think it was like nice for Eric Andre to show his range. Yeah, Where it's like, fair. hey, I don't just do this like nihilist uh, body, body disgusting humor, you know? How um, about the dog? <laughs> we haven't talked about the dog at all, but it's like a, kind of a major... I Yeah, the I, dog is like a major plot point. I really like that it's the dog that ends up kind of saving the day that it like confuses the robots but it's also exceptionally stupid i think it's realistic really yeah 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 totally you don't think that a robot would have pugs as part of its database like pugs are a common dog type <laughs> yeah they are abominations though so i think yeah, yeah. i like i just like, I like that i do like that i like the idea of like this the ai can't delineate the boundaries between these different categories yeah. and that's that funny the first time it happens i'm like okay this is going to come back but i think they could have used like one Point where it becomes like it goes from being a joke to like oh we can use this I think that they I don't know something about it feel like it missed I don't know some angle to it I this is just a personal preference but like, I hate when people uh, like pugs <laughs> <laughs> pugs are wrong pugs shouldn't exist it's a it's a it's a disgusting Let me aberration of nature. Let me where, ask you this: Like, can, imagine if if we had eugenesis. Let me. But they were like, instead of trying to in, in uh, like make humanity better genetically, we're just trying to make them worse, and that's what pugs worse. are. Let yeah. me ask you this: Yeah, what do you like better, pugs or French bulldogs? I guess French bulldogs because they're like seem more functional. They're no, not. <laughs> French bulldogs can't, can't exist. More nature. health problems. They can't even hop off the couch without getting broken hips. Wait, wait what are we talking about? French bulldogs? Yeah. yeah. Are those the little black and white things? No, 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 no that's a like, Boston Terrier. Yeah, yeah. What? Yeah, yeah, French bulldogs can't be. Go to born. Yale Town, dude. Anyway, I like the the dog is also another element of humor in this movie. Like, I feel like animal memes and animal humor is just like its own thing. Yeah. Like my wife was on the couch just doing her own thing, but anytime the dog jokes came on the <laughs> yeah. screen, she like looked up at it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> it's like its own category. It's like you got your slapstick. Yeah. You've got your I don't know like written humor, and yeah. then the animal humor. There was That's one. Fair. There was one joke with Munchie where I did laugh out loud, and it was at the end when they're saying goodbye to Katie at college, and she goes down and kisses Munchie on the head, and she's like. Uh, goodbye, King of Kings. Yeah, that was hilarious. <laughs> I was like, all right. Oh, and I loved how his, his crooked eyes came yeah, yeah, back that to was save the, the day. He's like, Ugh. But then he still misses it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought he was funny. And I think like awesome. if you're looking for animal humor, it scratches that itch pretty good. Yeah. Animals are so funny. They are funny. I love them. Pugs are great until they're like... <laughs> They're great as a five dog. years old or something. Well, they're great for a dog to visit. You don't want to own a pug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, they're, they're cute when they're young. When, when the older they get, they become like buffaloes. All their weight just shifts to their front, and <laughs> they can't breathe. <laughs> okay, before we were talking about the the dog, though, we were talking about the my voices. friend has a pug who's like All sixteen, right. and it looks like Jack Frost. Man. Jack Frost. <laughs> what? Because all the black eventually turns white, and it's just like salt. And I hate it. So I hate what? it. Get a golden retriever. A good normal they dog. All American. Anyways, they uh, had a quinceanera for this dog. <laughs> <It> turns, <laughs> geez, I'm just joking. It's over. Um, Mike Mike Rianda, the director and writer, 
plays Aaron, the and son. it coughs all the time. Stop, <laughs> stop. I hated the voice of the kid. Really? Did that, no, did it not bother you guys? It was just like, that's what they're going for. No, the moment know. he I opens his it. mouth, I'm just like, how am I supposed to believe that this is a child's voice? You're it not doesn't... supposed to. You're well, a voice actor. There's z- okay, well, you're maybe not it bugs to, me more. Yeah, you're not supposed to believe it's a child's voice. You're supposed to believe this kid is weird. Well, And it, I think it goes to serve like... The, I, the, I disagree. The voice totally did not coming from that kid is like just weird. I disagree. You're you're the the it's a it's a bad thing when a cartoon uh cannot convince you that the voice that you're hearing is coming from the character. I didn't have that problem. Okay, well if if you guys didn't have that experience, that's yeah. totally fine. But I mean, for me, it like really bugged me because I was like, that is a grown man's voice, and I can hear the bass that he should not have. Yeah, I didn't even as a nine year old or whatever he is. I didn't notice it, but maybe that guy's just he's a thick hogsman. Also, we're <laughs> such a weird family, but. Our son is into dinosaurs. So dinosaurs weird. So what a weird, weird thing to be into I, as a no little boy. Yeah, he dinosaurs. should have been an aviation nerd or something. Yeah, yeah. something. I don't know. I remember <laughs> talking not with less a, weird. I remember well, talking with a kid on a bus that loved fans, like spinning fans, because he's like, they're like helicopter, but like I can have them. And he I talked to me for like an hour what? on the bus about fans. <laughs> and I'm like, that's a better that'd be a way better thing <laughs> for him to better. be into. I like that little dinosaur they had on the antenna of the car though. Yeah, that was yeah. cute. That was fun. That saved it for me. Okay, last thing about the voice acting. Fred Armisen and Beck Bennett as the robots. 10 out of 10. Yeah. (laughs) 10 out of 10. I was kind of funny. It was funny to me because Fred Armisen is clearly the bigger uh, lister of of those two guys. But Beck Bennett had way more lines. I think it's because he's got the more invisible voice. Like, I recognize Fred Armisen anywhere, anytime. I couldn't couldn't place them when I watched the movie through because I was like, I recognize these voices. I don't know who they are. Oh, really? But yeah. then later I, I looked it up and then I watched a couple of clips again. I was like, but, oh, oh, yeah, I can yeah, totally yeah. hear it. But Beck, Beck Bennett was so good. As they it. were so good. I like that they, they didn't just get reprogrammed and then start being subservient to the Mitchells. They knew they shouldn't obey them. Yeah. But they did it anyway. <laughs> yeah. that, was a, that was a good gag, the green flash. They're, they're like, like, let's okay. go. And they're like, no, stop. And they're like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My name is Eric. My name is also Eric. No, I mean Deborah. But <laughs> five thousand, idiot. <laughs> we are humans. They were awesome. They were hilarious. They but got it's a lot super of far away. You'll never yeah. make it. It's eighty miles yeah. away. What are you doing to me right now? <laughs> <laughs> Find so them. Good. Oh, I found them. I found one too. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I love those them. Funny ones. I love those guys. There's, and like we we've talked about like the aesthetic, but the Sony Pictures movies. I think one of their strengths is like the the animation of it like the the energy that their animation mm. has and like how much humor just like the way people move and the way things are like are are, are animated uh really adds to the humor of it like cloud of the chance of meatballs is animated so different from any other like pixar or dreamworks mm. movie and that's why that's a big part why it's funny same with this like it's just like this kinetic energy the way that things bend and shape honestly they figured something out with humor it's like watching magic for me because i'm mm. like how do you make 3D animation, because like I've seen people 3D animating things, and they're like clicking keyframes and moving them into the thing, going through the timeline, like, oh, I made him walk one step, uh, huzzah. And they're like, what I'm watching here is like indistinguishable in in terms of fluidity from like hand-drawn animation. And I'm just like, brilliant. Like I have such yeah. respect for, for these animators. Well, I'm so glad we've kind of gone past the like reaching for like technical reality and we've we've gone back into expression. Right. I feel like yes. we're in a good time of 3D animation where it's it's about expression, not yeah. just about like getting the best looking we can. Yeah, we we've stopped with the final fantasy like oh, the trying spirits to be photo- within <laughs> oh, <laughs> trying God. to be photorealistic. Yeah. I think it'll I don't know. Do you think it's because we have solved that or it's because we're we're so close that but we're not quite there so it's uncanny valley and we know now that uncanny valley is bad so we go back to the stylistic and then maybe the only time we see photorealistic is when it's used in live action for like DA. We just don't or, even know. Yeah, I, I think that we've gotten to the point where if they really wanted to make a completely feature length photorealistic animated movie, they could. There would be like probably quite a few times when it when it g- goes into the uncanny valley and you're like, oh, that's that's awkward. I can see his eyes not moving right or whatever. But for the most part, like I think we had that capability like a long time ago. I remember playing, I remember playing Halo Four on Xbox. And I was like, these cutscenes look really good. But they don't now, though. Well, no, I think you go you go back and you're like, this looks really but good. And you, that was in 2014. But like that style is more abstracted from reality than you realize. It's same with like the Uncharted series. Like they're not realistically proportioned. They're all just like a little bit cartoony to avoid falling into the Uncanny Valley. Because once yeah. you give them like eyes, no, not, not eyes to nose, yeah, it is. 
Well, more, okay, maybe now, you, but like it's more than you realize. My, my argument for Halo would be that it's a lot easier to make it seem photorealistic because you're on a like a battle cruiser and there's like energy weapons going off and stuff, and it's like that looks really oh, good. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But the faces yeah. are the faces are always going to be the problem, and like yeah, the most know. realistic like animated faces still have to be abstracted a little bit because like. There's just going to be a little bit of the way something moves or the way the light glistens off of that just looks a little bit off. Do you remember like arguing about when we saw the trailer for the next uh, Senua's Sacrifice movie or oh, whatever yeah, it's called? Yeah. And we, do you remember that? Yep. We, we watched the trailer and I was like, that's not animated. There's no way. It's like, that's li- live action. And I was looking at it. I was like, that, it looks real it to looks me. Like, that's real. a person's face. And you were like, no, 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 it's animated. Blah, blah, blah. And people were like, oh, it's animated. Blah. But I'm like, honestly, if we're at the point where people are arguing about this, I think that's that's an argument for that we're there, basically. Yeah. I think we're going to find out with the next Avatar movie. Well, <laughs> if, if there's a movie that I'm aware exists that has the best chances of being just photorealistic, like, are they like ever going to put those movies out? Like, yes, and all at once. Really? Well, they're shooting like five. So it'll be like an annual release for five years. But like, how long have they been working on? Also, them? who like ten fuck years? Cares about Nobody. Avatar anymore? Nobody. Nobody but fucking cares. Nobody. It's so stupid. Yeah. When uh, they bring it back, I mean. But it's James fucking Cameron, man. It's gonna be sick. I don't know. Has he ever not sicked? <laughs> what is he gonna do for them? Does Dances with Wolves have a have a sequel? What? Because oh, the movie's basically Dances no! with Wolves. What is that? What is that? You got him. What? He's, he's that's a got him or a that's a reference to something? No, I'm laughing at it. Okay, you. nice. Because yeah. you're saying that that uh, the first Avatar was just a ripoff of that Basically. Fern Gully. Po- yeah. Pocahontas. Yeah. yeah, all the same thing. Anyways. The uh, Savage Noble We're not trope. talking about uh, this movie anymore. That's right. Tune in next week. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. I have a nitpick. <laughs> they realize at the first encounter with the robots that they can control the robot arms out externally. And it's very f- useful in the first fight. And they never use it again. That's really annoying. Wait, what to do me. you mean? She has like the robot arm that she can use the tractor beam yeah. on in the first fight. They never use it again. What are you talking about? That's the whole climax. They're using them. They were surfing on them. Yeah, it's at the end, end, end. But like they, they, there's two de- defunct robots that they could have gone and like harvested those parts. Like if I was in this survival uh, situation, the first thing I'm doing is getting as many of these arms as I can and like learning to use them. Yeah. Mistake. They were gonna die. That's fair. They were gonna <laughs> die. You know, I'm 100 percent with you on that, David. <laughs> This movie sucks. Come on. It's going down to a four. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Pretty good movie. All right, guys. Uh, tweet at us at Carpool Critics. Email us. Hello at CarpoolCritics.ca. Hello. And we'll email you back. We will. I do it. James will. It might take a month. Should I, should I start checking emails again? No. Nah, I like it. It's my thing. But what if people... <laughs> there are people who, like, reference... Like, say, send something to me specifically. I'll let you know. Okay. You haven't, though. I have before. No one sends me anything to you. <laughs> I've seen like them. twice. I check in there every once in a while. Like, I'll open a vi- I'll open an email and then I'll be like, okay, I should maybe look at this later. And then I set it back to unread so that James doesn't Shoot. know that I looked at it. Dang. I can tell. My auto delete. <laughs> I zero the inbox completely. You know what people should send us these days is another mailbag episode. Ooh. Oh yeah, we're close to a hundred thousand subscribers. We should definitely do another. So mailbag. We're gonna do another mailbag. Yeah. yeah, celebrate. We've got a couple in the bag, but we need more. So you in can the find mail. out whether we want to either fight a bear or become one. I want to be inside a bear, like at the end of <laughs> midsummer. I want to be inside a bear. Burnt alive? Do you? In every way. Inside a bear, naked ladies, concert. <laughs> See you later. Bye.